prayer. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, hope to you all nice uh, Friday and uh, coming uh, Eid uh, vacations. Uh, uh, today is one of uh, the cardio risk uh, waves. Uh, uh, today it is unusual because it will deal with antithrombotics and anticoagulants. And this is a very important and hot uh, topic with uh, uh, different clinical scenarios as we will uh, see. I would like to thank uh, Pfizer, uh, 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 the Liquis team, uh, for their uh, support uh, to Yava activity. Uh, and I would like to welcome my dear colleagues, uh, Adif Al-Bahari, Hani Ragi, uh, Ahmed Chawi, Tamil Mustafa, Walid Abdu. And I will leave the, the, uh, the stage to Dr. Atif to start the first scientific session. Dr. Atif. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ashraf Rida, for your uh, introduction. And uh, I'm honored to introduce my dear friend, Professor Hani Ragi for the first presentation in our uh, Yava uh, wave number four. Uh, it will be here a uh, very important topic, anti strategies in acute coronary syndrome patients complicated by atrial fibrillation. Professor Rani, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. With, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Professor Atta, for the introduction. Professor uh, Ashraf Rida, uh, dear colleagues um, and dear attendees. Uh, sometimes we fall into the difficult situation of... Uh, can you hear me well? I can hear some background noise. It's okay. Okay. It's okay, but it's okay. Sometimes we fall into uh, the difficult situation of patients who have acute coronary syndromes which are complicated by atrial fibrillation. Uh, and the whole world is looking at how we should manage those patients. Um, sorry, my slides are not moving. I'll stop sharing and share again. So fortunately- Your voice is interrupted. Yeah, do you have my slide now? Yes, but choice is interrupted. Yeah, I can't do anything about that. I'm sitting in the best area uh, of my house. It's but not bad uh, for me. It's okay. it's okay, you can go. You can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, 2020 uh, ESC guidelines for the management of acute coronary syndromes in patient, patients presenting without persistent ST segment elevation uh, are out, and the ones for the ST segment elevation are going to come this year. I don't need to remind you of the different types of classes, class 1, 2, which is 2A and B, and class 3. Basically, class 1 is what you should be doing, and class 2A is something that is probably good to be doing. Class 2B is something you should be careful about doing, but you can do, and class 3 is something you, you probably should not be doing. The level of evidence A is evidence derived from multiple randomized clinical trials or large meta-analysis. B is a single randomized clinical trial or large non-randomized study. And C is experts agreeing um, on uh, experts' opinion. So what is new regarding the topic we are talking today, which is uh, acute coronary syndromes complicated by atrial fibrillation? In antithrombotic treatment, in patients with atrial fibrillation, which had sad Chad's VOSC score more equal or more to one than men, and equal or more to two than women, after a short period of triple antiplatelet therapy, which is up to one week from the acute event, then double anticoagulant therapy or antiplatelet therapy is recommended as the default uh, strategy using a NOAC and a single antiplatelet agent, preferably clopidogrel. Discontinuation of the antiplatelet treatment, that is all antiplatelet treatment in patients treated with oral anticoagulants is recommended after 12 months, which is something that many doctors in Egypt do not do. So you, they put a stent in a patient who has had a non-STEMI, who has atrial fibrillation, and they give him a NOAC and clopidogrel, 
or a Noah can aspirin or a Noah can aspirin clopidogrel, whatever they do. But after one year, they keep him on the Noah and aspirin or on the Noah and clopidogrel because they believe that he has a stent. You don't need to do that. You need to stop the ant all antiplatelet treatment and keep the patient only on the oral anticoagulant, even though it's a coronary artery patient, after 12 months, except in very special situations, which I'm going to mention. You can use a dual anti antiplatelet or anticoagulant treatment with an oral anticoagulation and ticagrelor or parasugrel instead of an oral coagulation and clopidogrel in patients with a moderate or high risk of stent thrombosis, irrespective of the stent type used. So if, for instance, you do left main crushing in a patient uh, who's diabetic and has, uh, you know, you're really worried about stent thrombosis and you want to use ticagrelor and prasugrel, you can actually use them instead of clopidogrel, but with a single uh, other agent, you don't need aspirin, you can use it with an oral anticoagulant and this is uh, not class one, but you can do it. It's class two. And in this case, you're going to give ticagrelor and, for instance, any of the NOACs that you choose, uh, you know, without aspirin. And uh, if you don't want to use clopidogrel and you feel that this was a STEMI patient, uh, uh, a non STEMI patient with large thrombus burden and a complex a high in, uh, risk of stem thrombosis. So this is the algorithm for antithrombotic therapy in non-ST elevation acute patients without atrial fibrillation, and you should know it. You should always know that everything you look at and everything that people tell you is talking about patients without atrial fibrillation. In the next six or seven slides, I'm going to show you the patients with atrial fibrillation because they are a special group of patients. And things that are in this slide for patients without atrial fibrillation do not apply to patients with atrial fibrillation who need anticoagulation. So these are the recommendations, uh, six slides for the recommendations of combining antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome patients requiring anticoagulation. Number one, you have to do stroke prevention uh, uh, in patients with, as we mentioned, the high chads vasc score. This is class 1A. For patients with one non-sex risk uh, stroke risk, like uh, one in men or or uh, or one in, one in one because she's a woman uh, wouldn't count as that. But if she has a one non-sex stroke risk factor, oral anticoagulation should be considered, and treatment may be individualized based on net clinical benefit. That is meaning that if the patient has score one only because she's a female with no other risk factors you can probably apply the situation of patients without atrial fibrillation on them. An early invasive coronary angiography, ECA is invasive coronary angiography, should be considered in high bleeding risk patients, irrespective of oral anticoagulation exposure. So if they come to you and they're anticoagulated with a NOAC, take them to the cath lab as soon as possible, work radially. To expedite treatment allocation, medical versus PCI versus cabbage, because this will determine the optimal antithrombotic pressure. So don't delay an early invasive coronary angiography in patients with high bleeding risk, because depending on what you're going to do, that is how you're going to use your antithrombotic pressure. Patients who are undergoing coronary stenting, anticoagulation, during PCI, additional parenteral anticoagulation is recommended, irrespective of the timing of the last dose of all NOACs and of all warfarin, if the INR is 2.5 in warfarin-treated patients. So if you get a patient who's already on a NOAC, and he's taken to the cat lab, even though he's taken their NOACs on time, you still have to give your 5,000 units of heparin if you're working regularly. And that's class 1C. In patients with an indication of oral anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonist in combination with aspirin or clopidogrel, the dose intensity of the warfarin should be regulated with a target INR of 2 to 2.5 and time and therapeutic range of more than 70%. You can see the class of evidence in the level on the right. I won't keep reading them for time. Uninterrupted therapeutic anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonist or NOAC should be considered during the periprocedural phase. Don't let anybody stop the anticoagulants for you and bridge with heparin. Wrong practice, just don't do it because it's, it's in the guidelines that you shouldn't be doing that. 
regarding the antiplatelet treatment, in patients with atrial fibrillation, Chad's VOSC score more than one in men and two in women, after a short uh, time of, of triple antithrombotic treatment, which is up to one week from the acute uh, event, double antithrombotic treatment is recommended as the default strategy using a NOAC at the recommended dose for stroke prevention and a single or antiplatelet agent, preferably clopidogrel. Is this clear? I hope it is. Very procedural DAP administration consisting of aspirin clopidogrel up to one week is recommended. So this is class 1A. The patients get given aspirin, clopidogrel, and ANOAC for one week. After one week, the aspirin is discontinued and the ANOAC and the clopidogrel are continued. Discontinuation in, plate, in antiplatelet treatment in patients treated with oral anticoagulation is recommended after 12 months. So I remind you again that at 12 months, you have to call the patients and stop the clopidogrel. If they had been an aspirin, also stop the aspirin. Whatever uh, the, uh, antiplatelet agent they were on, they will stop it, and they will continue with their stent-in only on oral anticoagulation. All patients treated with a VKA, example, those with a prosthetic uh, mitral valve, for instance, Clopidogrel alone should be considered in select patients where the has blood is more three or uh, uh, the ARC uh, HBR met a low risk of stent thrombosis for up to 12 months. When rivaroxaban is used and concerns about high bleeding uh, uh, risk prevails over stent thrombosis or stroke risk, you should use the small dose of rivaroxaban, 15 milligram compared to the 20 milligrams for the duration of the concomitant SAP to adapt. That is meaning if the patient has a high bleeding risk and you're not worried, you're not very worried about stent thrombosis or ischemic stroke because it's not a very a thrombotic, uh, uh, high thrombotic risk patient. You, that means that you should score your patients because if your patient has a high stent thrombosis or high ischemic stroke risk, you're actually going to use the rivaroxaban 20 and you know uh, you have to worry about the bleeding if it happens. Now, if the patient has a high bleeding, the same for dabigatran, uh, if you uh, use dabigatran in a high bleeding risk patient, which you're not worried about thrombosis, use the lower dose of 110 milligram, preferred to the 150 uh, milligram dose. If the patient uh, treated with uh, oral anticoagulant, aspirin plus clopidogrel for longer than one week and up to one month should be considered in those with high ischemic risk or other anatomical procedures that outweigh the bleeding risk. That's to a or prasugrel may be considered as an alternative to the triple antithrombotic therapy, which was recommended in the, in the first week with oral anticoagulant aspirin clopidogrel in a patient with moderate or high risk of stent thrombosis, irrespective of the stent type used. So if you want to use ticagrel or prasugrel because you feel that this patient has a high stent thrombosis, or let us assume that your patient is clopidogrel resistant, and you know that, or you're worried about that, you can do it. You can use ticagrelor with a NOAC without aspirin. The use of ticagrelor or prasugrel, however, in a part of triple antithrombotic therapy is not recommended. So it's not recommended to use ticagrelor plus aspirin plus a NOAC. Finally, for a medically managed patient, you need one antiplatelet uh, agent in addition to uh, an oral anticoagulant, should be considered for up to one year, and in patients with atrial fibrillation, a pixaban, 5 milligram BID, and a single antiplatelet therapy, clopidogrel, for at least six months may be considered. And there will be a whole presentation about this today. And this is class 2B, level of evidence B. This is the algorithm for antithrombotic therapy in non ST segment elevation, acute coronary syndrome patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing either PCI or medical management. There is a default strategy, and there's a strategy for high bleeding risk, and there's a strategy for high ischemic risk. In the default strategy, all patients, whatever the risk is, get a triple therapy for one week. And then in the default strategy, they get a double therapy for up to 12 months, followed by, and then in the, in the high bleeding risk, they, got, they get a double therapy uh, uh, for, with a single antiplatelet for six months, and then you can stop and start the NOAC alone at six months. In the high ischemic risk, uh, 
you actually give the triple therapy, you can extend the triple therapy with including the aspirin for up to one month and then continue the double therapy um, up to one year. And the double therapy can be take a lower clopidogrel if you want. After one year, everybody again goes to the same management where you stop all uh, antiplatelets, regardless of the basic risk, because after one year, you only need the NOAC. Um, uh, the, there is a preference for a NOAC over a VKA for the default strategy, unless there's a contraindication like a prosthetic valve. And the recommended doses for the NOACs are a Pixaban twice daily, five milligram, it's standard dose, Babigatran, either in the reduced dose or the standard dose, idoxaban in the standard dose, and rivaroxaban, either in the reduced dose or the standard dose, as I mentioned. NOAC dose reductions are recommended in all patients with renal failure and may be considered in patients with an ARC high bleeding risk. SAPT, preference for a P2Y, if you're going to keep the patient on a single antiplatelet therapy with the NOAC, it's better that this single antiplatelet therapy is a P2Y12 inhibitor and not aspirin. And ticagrelor can be considered for the patients with high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk. Treatment more than one month, oral anticoagulant plus DAPT, uh, which is a, a triple antithrombotic therapy, may be considered for up to six months in select patients with a very high ischemic risk. Treatment more than 12 months in patients with a high ischemic risk, high ongoing ischemic risk from untreated lesions, you can consider continuing a SAPT plus the oral anticoagulation. But if you're only worried about the stent you put, you can stop the, the, you can stop the uh, antiplatelet agents at 12 months. But what if the patient has un, other untreated lesions that you want to give an antiplatelet for? You can certainly do that. What about bleeding management? These are my last three slides. Recommendations for bleeding management and blood transfusion in non-ST segment elevation patients will anticoagulate patients. If the patient has a dabigatran-associated bleeding, there is actually an antidote, specific antidote, which is idrazuzumab, and it should be considered. In patients with VKA-associated life-threatening bleeds, rapid reversal of anticoagulation with four-factor PCC rather than fresh frozen plasma should be considered in addition to repetitive doses of vitamin K. In patients with no associated ongoing blood threatening lead, the administration of PCC or activated PCC should be considered when specific antidote is not is unavailable. In patients with rivaroxaban, apixaban, or edoxaban, the administration of specific antidote, if available, adexanat alpha, may be considered. In patients with anemia and no active bleeding, Blood transfusion may be considered in case of compromised hemodynamic status, a hematocrit of less than 25% or hemoglobin less than 8%. This is my last slide. I just want to mention that some of the data and the guidelines were from a very recent trial, the Augustus trial, which has been uh, 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 written in circulation this year, and which is going to be presented at the end of, uh, of this uh, uh, hopefully very useful day. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, honey. Thank you. Actually, uh, uh, actually, this field is very uh, dynamic field. Uh, uh, it's the first time for me to hear about uh, uh, you can stop uh, antiplatelet therapy after one month if the patient is stable and you put a stent and no other lesions. But I want to ask I'm you, that yeah. I, I have a comment here. Uh, usually, when one get a lesion and you put a stent, you definitely have atherosclerotic plaque here and there. Should we consider that a reason for continuing uh, dual antiplatelet therapy beyond one year? Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. And now, Professor Ashraf, uh, we have some proof that uh, anticoagulants work very well for prevention of recurrent events in coronary artery disease. Uh, but the old anticoagulant which was present was very difficult to use. It was warfarin. And you could not uh, give it without, uh, it, it required monitoring and most of the patients were out of the therapeutic range a lot of time. But we use anticoagulation to stop events like heparin and, and oxyparin, clexan. We use it when we're really worried. That's actually when we, in the acute situation, we use anticoagulant. Anticoagulants stop blood clots in the coronary. And indeed, we have now data 
on, for instance, the small dose of the river oxaban, the ATLAS trial data, which is 2.5 milligram twice daily for both coronary and peripheral arterial disease, anticoagulation works. So now we have the NOAX, and we know the data has shown that if you, if after one year, you don't have a high, uh, you're, not, you're not worried about thrombotic risk of the stent anymore, and the patient is already on, on an anticoagulant, say the patient is on apixaban, five milligram twice daily, and on clopidogrel. After one year, just stop the clopidogrel. It's, uh, cardiologists have a mental resistance to this, but it has been proven by trial data to be safe because it's actually, they don't get, the patients don't pay a thrombotic penalty in price. The apixaban protects them against coronary clots and thrombosis. But if you keep the, the clopidogrel with the apixaban, they actually pay a penalty in bleeding. So at the end, you're absolutely right, and all of you have told us that we have to individualize. There is no blanket for all patients. If you feel that your patient had had recurrent events before, or you are worried about their compliance with the oral anticoagulation, and you want to have a blanket sort of uh, spare tire thing lately. I mean, there are many, many reasons why you might decide to give an antiplatelet. But one of them should not be the cardiologist's fixed idea that this has to be done for all patients, because it does not have to be done for all patients. I hope this was an answer. To the yeah, yeah, sure. Excellent answer. Dear, uh, dear Hany, thank you very much for your uh, uh, good illustration for these uh, new guidelines. Uh, if we have uh, four uh, oral anticoagulants recently now in the guidelines. Uh, the preference, which one you prefer, or you individualize the patients according to. So, if we have liver of Sapan, Apixapan, you have uh, and, and others, what's your preference in your clinical practice uh, and how to individualize them? I, I try to um, look at the trial data and the guidelines. So, for instance, we now have the Augustus data, which is going to be meant for me uh, with, with Lupidogrel. Uh, uh, sometimes, rarely, I would use Apixaban with Ticagrelor, and I really like that when I do that, because the patient takes two pills of each twice daily. It's so easy for the patient to remember. Of course, in Colonois, so also in Colonois. But that's the patient with, uh, with low bleeding risk and high thrombotic risk. If I feel and I know that my patient is a patient who is non-compliant to treatment will, will, will take their pills once daily, then I will give them Rivaroxaban and, uh, and the Pidogrel once a day, and that's it. Uh, so again, it's tailoring. Uh, the, I, I have no experience with Edoxaban, and the one which is available in Egypt is a generic. And I do respect all Egyptian generics because if the Ministry of Health approves a drug, it's not my responsibility as a physician to, uh, to make anybody suspect it. But, however, because I'm talking about preventing stroke. Stroke, to me, is the most... I mean, I have been told by many patients, including my own grandmother, that she would rather die than have a debilitating stroke. Many Egyptians feel that stroke is worse than death. So for that, I'd really, really like to be absolutely sure that I'm giving the patients the medicine that I would like to take or to give to my own family. So in a way, if cost is not an issue, I have a very strong feeling uh, towards, in, in NOAX in particular, because I can't measure anything. It's not like a generic statin where I can measure the LDL. It's a NOAX. I can't measure anything. If, if the person who's made it did not make it properly, um, my patients are going to suffer. So my concern is more about using brand NOAX than it's using which NOAX. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a, a bit of a concern. I don't want to sound unpatriotic or to say anything against the Egyptian drug industry. I totally respect them. I'm sure the drugs are very, very good. It's just a personal concern which I'd like to share with you. And it's not done to promote pharma, by the way. Uh, thank you, Hany. This is actually, you touch one of the points that will be discussed in the panel discussion. And I know you have uh, commitments uh, uh, now.
And I hope you can join us in the uh, experience. Thank you. I will try to come back to the panel discussion. Unfortunately, I have a, at 7 p.m. I have a meeting I with know. people from the United States, but I will try to excuse myself. And okay. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, lecture and see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I will leave the I will leave the stage now to Professor Osama Sarad Samir Mustafa to lead the second session. And Professor Samir, Professor Samir, Professor Samir, Now time we will go to the second session. Uh, Professor Dr. Walid Abdu. Professor of Cardiology, Monofia University, choice of anticoagulant in elderly patient and in patient with renal impairment. Very hot subject uh, and topic, and uh, we will uh, be enjoyed with you, Dr. Walid. Uh, thank you, Sir Osama, for the nice introduction. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ashraf and uh, all my professors in the AFA board for this um, continuous CME and scientific waves. Uh, my talk will be about the choice of the anticoagulant in the elderly population and in patients with uh, renal impairment. Uh, I will start with the definition of the elderly. The WHO and uh, European Institute of Cardiology Guideline 2018 define the elderly as uh, old who are um, aged uh, equal to or more than 65 years old very old who are uh, equal to or more than 80 years old. The United Nations uh, definition 2019 defined elderly as young old from 65 to 75 years old, old old from 75 to 85 years old, and very old equal to or more than 85 years old. And actually the number of the elderly patients continues to increase dramatically to be 8.5% of the current world's population in 2020. And it is expected to double to be um, about 17% by uh, 2050. And it is well known that the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is much increased with increasing uh, the age, uh, either in uh, males or females. And the patients with atrial fibrillation, either males or females, have about five-fold increase in the risk of ischemic stroke compared with uh, patients with, without uh, atrial fibrillation. And actually, this risk is more aggravated uh, in the elderly, as the age itself is an independent uh, risk factor for poor outcome in atrial fibrillation patients, as ischemic stroke and systemic embolism uh, incidence is higher in the elderly with uh, age more than 75 years old compared to other uh, age group. Also, uh, with the use of oral anticoagulants, the major bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage is much increased with the elderly population more than 75 years old uh, compared to other uh, age group. And if we, if we look to the uh, uh, components of the chad basque score, we find that the uh, um, elderly population uh, or elderly patient with atrial fibrillation aged 75 years old uh, or more without any other uh, risk factors is given a score of two, which is um, which equals to uh, a patient with a history of a stroke or TIA, which is given also a score of two. And as we know, with the uh, aging and the elderly population, there is much common incidence of having more uh, uh, comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, vascular disease, heart failure, and for sure the shed vascular score will be increasing and also the annual risk of a stroke is much increased. That's why in the uh, um, uh, guidelines, the uh, oral anticoagulation therapy uh, uh, to be given to those patients is given class one uh, recommendation level of evidence A to be given to all male AF patients with shed vascular score uh, two or more, or, and all female AF patients with shed vascular score three or more. And it was given a class of recommendation two level of, of evidence uh, B for male AF patients with shed vascular score of one and female AF patient with shed vascular score uh, of, of two. But the question is, 
which uh, anticoagulant uh, uh, is, is, uh, is effective and safe to be given to uh, general population and to the elderly uh, uh, as a specific group. Randomized trials have shown that compared to placebo or untreated uh, control, warfarin adjusted to INR from two to three was associated with uh, about 64% relative risk reduction in the stroke and systemic embolization. Although the warfarin increased the major bleeding and the intracranial hemorrhage, it also decreased the all-cause uh, mortality bar by 26%, indicating a clear net clinical benefit of uh, giving uh, anticoagulation like warfarin versus placebo or untreated control. But despite the clinical benefit of oral anticoagulation, uh, it's in the elderly, it is still often avoided by uh, many of the physicians. And studies showed that uh, patients with atrial fibrillation who were admitted with acute ischemic stroke, just 10% of them were on warfarin in a therapeutic INR, 29% were on warfarin with sub-therapeutic INR, and more than 60% were already not on any anticoagulation. And this inertia, actually, in prescribing the oral, anticoag uh, oral anticoagulation to the elderly, especially uh, 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 the warfarin, uh, is because this group of patients often uh, associated with uh, uh, increased bleeding risk, which is a major problem in the elderly, also increased other comorbidities, decreased decrease renal and hepatic function, which increases also the uh, um, effect of the drug and maybe increase the bleeding risk for some patients, altered body composition that affect the uh, drug metabolism and drug absorption and distribution, polypharmacy, and the uh, risk of falls, which is common in the elderly with the uh, uh, risk of head trauma, for example, and increase the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage. Furthermore, warfarin, is, 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 it seems it is not the best option for uh, uh, um, the elderly population uh, specifically because it has uh, many challenges like frequent monitoring and necessitating, necessitating, necessitating regular clinic attendance, narrow therapeutic window, slow onset and offset of action, long half-life, a lot of drug-drug interaction and drug-diet uh, interaction, genetic polymorphism exists which may increase the sensitivity uh, or the resistance to warfarin, also unpredictable uh, pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics leading to inter and intra individual vari variability in the response to uh, uh, warfarin. So it was important to uh, interrupt the co this coagulation uh, co cas cascade by a way other than uh, uh, targeting the vitamin K dependent clotting factors like by direct thrombin inhibitors using the dabigatran or anti-direct anti-factor 10 using the abixaban, rivaroxaban, and eduxaban. So it seems that direct oral anticoagulants may be the better option than vitamin K antagonists, especially in the elderly, because there is no INR, there is no frequent monitoring, fixed dosing, less drug-drug and drug-diet interaction, and it is not vitamin K dependent. But first, we have to know what is the efficacy and safety of uh, 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 the direct, uh, oral uh, direct oral anticoagulants uh, in the elderly compared to uh, warfarin? Unfortunately, there is no randomized controlled trials of NOAX versus vitamin K antagonists designed specifically in the elderly. So we have to look at the data from the or, uh, elderly subgroups in the uh, already existing randomized control trials. If we look to the RELY trial, uh, studied the dabigatran versus warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. It, it was shown that dabigatran 110 was associated with rates of stroke and systemic embolism that were similar to warfarin, as well as lower rate of major bleeding. While dabigatran 150, as compared to warfarin, was associated with lower rate of stroke and systemic embolization but similar rate of major bleeding. And in the RELY trial, uh, about 40% of the studied population were more than 75 years old, and about 4% uh, uh, were older, more than 85 years old. So the data from the RELY tri uh, trial, it seems to be consistent uh, uh, um, for the uh, elderly population. <clears throat> 
In the rocket AF trial, studied the rivaroxaban versus warfarin in the non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It was shown that uh, in the rivaroxaban group, there, there, uh, there was 21% relative risk reduction in the stroke or systemic embolization versus warfarin. And in the rocket AF trial, about 44% of the patients were more than 75 years old. About 5% of the patients were uh, more than 85 years old. And it was shown that the great benefit of rivaroxaban actually was derived from the great benefit that was obtained from the elderly population more than 75 years old with 20% relative risk reduction in the st stroke and systemic embolization uh, more than uh, those patients less than 75 years old. But on the uh, uh, other hand, the rivaroxaban treated patients had a significantly shorter time to their first major gastrointestinal bleeding event compared with warfarin. In the Aristotle trial, I studied the abixaban versus warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. Abixaban uh, versus warfarin uh, uh, showed 21% relative risk reduction in the stroke and systemic embolization, and also 31% relative risk reduction uh, versus uh, uh, warfarin in the major bleeding, as defined by the International Society of Thrombosis and uh, uh, Hemostasis. And in the Aristotle trial, 31% of the population were more than 75 years old, 13% of the population were more than 80 years old, and fewer patients were more than 90 years old. So again, it seems that the result from the Aristotle trial is maintained uh, for the uh, uh, elderly population. In the Engage AF TM48 trial, it studied the edoxaban versus uh, warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. Also, uh, In the Engage AF uh, trials, 40% uh, of the patients were more than 75 years old, about 4% about, uh, uh, of the patients were uh, more than 85 uh, years old. And uh, the uh, trial showed that Ezoxaban reduced dose th uh, 30 milligram was as effective as warfarin in reducing the uh, stroke and systemic embolization, while a standard dose of 60 milligram was significantly uh, better than warfarin in reducing stroke and systemic embolization. And regarding the major bleeding, both doses of edoxaban uh, uh, showed significant uh, uh, reduction in the major bleeding uh, compared to uh, warfarin. So uh, uh, from the four trials, rely rocket AF, Aristotle, and engage atrial fibrillation trials, the efficacy and safety of NOAX compared with, with warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation aged 75 years or older, NOAX are at least as effective or superior to warfarin in prevention of uh, stroke or systemic embolization, as well as they have similar rate of bleeding, uh, uh, like um, warfarin with uh, great preference towards uh, the abixaban and the reduced dose of uh, edoxaban. But it, it is of interest to know that all NOAX significantly re uh, reduce the interior intracranial bleeding, which is a major concern in our management in the elderly population. In 2014, uh, in the European Heart Journal, about three years after the publication of the original Aristotle trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they published this uh, uh, extension or observation from the Aristotle trial uh, uh, studying the efficacy and safety of abixaban compared with warfarin according to age for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. And it was shown that abixaban was superior uh, to warfarin in reduction of stroke, systemic embolization, all cause mortality, major bleeding, all bleeding, intracranial uh, 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 bleeding, and greater benefit was observed in the elderly population more than 75 years old compared to other age group. As a conclusion of the, um, this uh, observation study, that uh, the benefit of abixaban versus warfarin in reducing stroke or systemic embolism, causing less bleeding and decreasing mortality, were consistent in patients with atrial fibrillation regardless of the age, with an even greater absolute benefit with increasing age. In light of this data, abixaban was demonstrated to be very attractive for stroke prevention in AF across the spectrum of age and particularly for the elderly.
What about patients who are very elderly, 90 years of, of, uh, of age or more? This uh, paper was published 2018 in the circulation, studied oral anticoagulation in the very elderly patients with atrial fibrillation and aimed to investigate the risk of ischemic stroke and intracranial hemorrhage and the net clinical benefit of, or of oral anticoagulation treatment for very elderly patients with AF 90 years of age or more. And it was shown that compared with patients taking warfarin, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation uh, more than 90 years of age taking NOAX were associated with lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage with no significant difference in the ischemic stroke or major bleeding. And the conclusion of this uh, um, study shows that among patients with AF uh, 90 years of age or more, uh, or anticoagulation may still be considered as thrombo uh, thromboprophylaxis for those patients with NOAX being the more favorable choice. And more recently in 2020, this paper was published it studies the effectiveness and safety of uh, oral anticoagulants in elderly patients with atrial fibrillation. And the interesting part of this study is that they made a head-to-head -head comparison of NOAX. They excluded the eduxaban just because the, uh, 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 there was few, few patients uh, uh, taking eduxaban in the study, but they, make, uh, they made this head-to-head uh, uh, -head comparison uh, um, among the other uh, agents of NOAC, and they show that there is no significant difference in the risk uh, of a stroke and systemic embolization uh, with using of different uh, types of NOACs, but uh, the standard dose of uh, abixaban was treated with lower risk of a major bleeding when compared to standard dose of, uh, of riparoxaban. Also, reduce, uh, the reduced dose of uh, abixaban and the reduced dose of debicatran uh, uh, were associated with uh, lower risk of major bleeding compared to uh, reduced dose of uh, rivaroxaban. Actually, renal impairment also is a big concern and is common in the elderly population. How uh, uh, can we use the NOAX according to the renal function? In the randomized controlled trials of NOAX for stroke prevention AF, a creatine clearance of less than 50 ml per minute was used to adapt NOAC dosage. In patients with creatine clearance from 15 to 30 ml per minute, randomized control trials derived data on the effect of NOAC is lacking. These patients were essentially excluded from the major randomized control trials. But there is, there is still a benefit of cautious use of anti-factor 10 or anticoagulation like rivaroxaban, abixaban, and edoxaban in this patient group with creatine clearance from 15 to 30 ml per minute. And this uh, data from the Aristotle trial uh, showing the primary outcome in the elderly, uh, more than 75 years old in relation to the renal function, and it was shown that abixaban was superior uh, um, or, or at least as effective as warfarin and the benefit extended to uh, all patients with um, different uh, GFR uh, in the reduction of the stroke systemic mobilization and also reduction in the major bleeding and the benefit was consistent even if the GFR uh, was less than 30 down to 15 uh, ml per minute. What about if the patient GFR is less than 15 ml per minute? Actually, the evidence for the benefit of NOAX in patients with end-stage renal disease with creatine clearance less than 15 ml per minute or on dialysis is even more limited and controversial. So this is the uh, um, European Heart Rhythm Association guidelines about the use of NOAX according to the GFR. So patient on dialysis or uh, GFR less than 15 ml per minute, NOAX are not recommended. From 15 to 30, to 30 ml per minute, still the bigatran is not recommended, but we can cautiously use the reduced dose of rivaroxaban, reduced dose of edoxaban, or reduced dose of abixaban. From 30 to 50 ml per minute, we can use dabicatran 110 or 150 according to, according to the bleeding risk. We can use a, a reduced dose of rivaroxaban and a reduced dose of edoxaban. We can use uh, either standard dose or reduced dose of abixaban, but the reduced dose is given if at least two out of three criteria are fulfilled. If the age more than 80 years, body weight less than 60 kilogram, or serum creatinine uh, more than or equal to 1.5, in this situation, we can use the reduced dose of abixaban. Uh, above 50 ml, ml uh, GFR ml per minute, we can use the standard dose of either of the NOACs.
So to conclude, the choice of NOAX for stroke prevention AF according to the patient characteristics uh, in general population and also in the elderly. If the patient is elderly, we can use NOAX preferred for sure over vitamin K antagonist. We can use abixaban, dabigatran reduced dose, edoxaban because they are associated with lower rate of major bleeding than warfarin. If there is high risk of bleeding, you can use abixaban, edoxaban, or reduced dose of dabigatran. If there is previous GI bleeding, you can use abixaban or edoxaban. In severe renal impairment, abixaban is better than rivaroxaban, which is better than edoxaban. With uh, uh, dyspepsia or GERD, you can use abixaban, rivaroxaban, or edoxaban. If the patient has a nasogastric tube or big tube for enteral administration, we can use abixaban or rivaroxaban. But if the patient is concerned about the number of pills per day, or there is, if there is a concern about non iterans to twice daily regimen, or there is a request to minimize the pill burden, so we can use the once daily uh, uh, agents of NOAX like rivaroxaban or edoxaban. Finally, in the COVID pandemics, it is recommended by the British Society of Hematology and uh, Royal College of General Practitioners, the Anticoagulation Forum, it is recommended to switch all patients, especially the elderly, from vitamin K antagonist to NOAX whenever possible to minimize the need for frequent monitoring and clinic visits. So my take home message, dear professors and colleagues, the prevalence and risk of atrial fibrillation increases with aging. Although age alone is not a, is not a contraindication for anticoagulant therapy, underuse and underdosing of anticoagulants are common in older patients. NOAX are relevant and effective therapeutic intervention for stroke prevention in the elderly patients with atrial fibrillation. The, the decision regarding the appropriate agent and dose should be based on clinical evidence for efficacy and safety, especially in the elderly, taking into account clinical, geriatric criteria and renal function. Physician confidence in prescribing NOAX for, for elderly patients and finally, randomized controlled trials comparing NOAC versus NOAC in general population and in the elderly specifically are awaiting. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rohit, and uh, welcome, uh, Professor Hazim Khamis. And I leave the stage for Osama Sanad and Tamir Mustafa for the discussion with Professor Rohit. Hi, Dr. Hazim, an hour. دكتور تامر انا حابب اسال الدكتور وليد هو حطينا في دايليما از ريجارد الالدلري اللي هو خلينا نقول الالدلري اباف ذا ايج اوف 75 عشان انا والدكتور اشرف قاعدين اكشولي بس في اكشولي اب تيل ناو ذير از نو ديفينيت ذير از نو شور ديفينيشن فور الالدلري Well, most accepted who are above the age of 70 years. This is, uh, we, are, uh, we are now feeling a dilemma when to use uh, NOAX in patient above the age of 75, to, about to use uh, rivaroxaban once daily or abixaban uh, twice daily, especially uh, the elderly patient is fully medicated and adherence uh, rate is well with once daily. However, the safer, as we, you have mentioned in more than one slide, is toward the apixaban. Second point is that apixaban can be adjusted dose according to the age, as you have, to the age and renal function and uh, also to the weight. But I, now I, 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 I need a clear guideline. Above the age of 70, you, you start with apixaban or rivaroxaban. Thank you, Dr. Osama. Uh, actually, it is not an easy question um, um, because we have two issues. We have the issue of the adherence and we have the issue of the safety. If we look at the issue of the safety as a priority, um, trials showed that uh, abixaban, uh, either the standard dose or the reduced dose, both of them um, uh, uh, showed uh, significantly uh, less Uh, major bleeding and uh, more importantly, uh, less intracranial bleeding. So, um, as a safety uh, uh, priority, I will prefer abixaban. Re regarding the adherence, reduce dose or at full dose. Regarding the adherence, uh, because the abixaban is, is is given twice daily and the rifaxaban, for example, is given once daily, I think it is not a big deal. Um, 
because there is some uh, programs, in, uh, especially in the elderly, are, uh, are uh, given to increase the adherence. If uh, um, the, 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 the adherence is the main concern, we can encourage the patient uh, about the um, uh, safety of the, of the drug, about the risk of intracranial uh, bleeding, the major bleeding, the GIT bleeding. We can help the patient about the adherence uh, by um, uh, either remainder, either uh, uh, we can give him uh, the box tablets, you can uh, encourage the attendance or the relatives just to remind him with the dosing uh, schedule. Uh, uh, because I, uh, for my opinion, uh, I put the safety of for any drug, especially in the elderly, I put it as a priority before any other things. And the full dose, I think, uh, in response to your uh, answer, Professor Osama, full dose unless uh, creatinine is above 1.5 or his weight is below 60 kilograms. But I have a comment, uh, Dr. Walid, uh, with Dr. Osama, uh, uh, إن في الابيكسبان لما خفضوا الجرعه الاستروكس زادت اه يعني انا معاك ان مفيش بليدنج انتركرينيال هيموريج ولا والبليدنج قل او مش موجود زي زي الريفروكسبان لكن الاستروك زاد يعني يعني لما نقارن الاثنين برضو ده بيحط لنا في وضعيه لازم احنا نقرا الصادس نقراها صح يعني انت النهارده بتدي اثنين ونص للالدرلي لما لما ادهم ال 15 ملي جرام ريفروكسفان للالدرلي وال 2.5 ابيكسفان في الالدرلي الاستروكس قلت في الريفروكسفان ولكن زادت في الابيكسفان بغض النظر عن موضوع البليدنج. واتس يور ستيتمنت فور ذات؟ والله يا دكتور عاطف هو الحقيقه تيل ناو ذير از نو يعني كلير هيد تو هيد كومبارزون. Between different types of drugs, um, uh, to include a uh, big number of, of patients and to follow uh, up the uh, the result regarding the stroke and uh, major. But the the trial, I will, I, I will show in one of my slides that uh, when they compared the abixaban versus the dabigatran versus rivaroxaban, either in the standard dose and reduced dose, there was no significant difference. Uh, between them regarding the stroke and systemic embolization. But the difference was clear regarding the reduction of the uh, major bleeding in the standard dose of abixaban uh, compared to standard dose of rivaroxaban and also reduced dose of abixaban versus reduced dose of, uh, uh, of rivaroxaban. So, uh, uh, still, still a clear uh, uh, um, or big, big study that including uh, large number of patients and pull up for, for longer duration, I think we still uh, don't have a clear answer about the preference of one uh, of the NOACs over the other. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for such a lovely uh, presentation, Professor Walid. Uh, Professor Atif, your question is very important, actually. Um, in Aristotle, actually, the efficacy of apixaban was maintained even in 2.5. What you're talking about is the real-world data. After uh, rocket AFib and rely, a lot of people are using the lower dose of the bigotran and rivaroxaban uh, because fear of bleeding. And this happened with apixaban because of the data of rivaroxaban and the bigotran. The low dose of uh, apixaban should not be used unless you have two out of three. And this is around three to four percent of patients with atrial fibrillation, not like rivaroxaban, which could be used in maybe 20, 30, 40 percent of patients. So the problem is coming from the real-world data underdosing by us physicians, but in the randomized controls data, 2.5 apixaban, when given in the context of the right dosage, is as protective as the 5 milligrams. Very good question. Uh, Dr. Atif, uh, 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 your question is very nice. Uh, there is definitely a high dose better, but the interaction between the high dose and the high and low dose, it is not significant, which means that uh, Dr. Ahmed Shaw is right, and there is, is, is the protective effect is not, diff, it's not not significant between the high dose or low dose. But actually, uh, uh, when I facing a patient with uh, uh, 80 years or 85 years, uh, I'd be anxious to give him a full <laughs> dose. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, even the data uh, 
recommend the high dose, but actually I will feel. What you recommend, Dr. Walid? Um, yeah, this this is uh, can be um, done on individual basis to uh, We can uh, we see on, uh, if the patient has another um, factor that increase the bleeding risk. For example, uncontrolled hypertension. <laughs> والدته جالها براكزوسما الاي اف اشرف عارف القصه اعتقد او حاجه واداها ابيكسابام 5 ملي جرام تويس ديلي وبعد كده الاي اف رجعت ساينس وبعد ما رجعت ساينس وهي ماشيه على ابيكسابام جالها 5 ملي جرام تويس ديلي جالها سيريبرال هيموريج ودايت تو دي فبرضه لاحظ يعني هي هير ايج 85 ييرز فالموضوع برضه يعني مش ما اعتقدش انه سهل قوي يا دكتور احمد ان الواحد هيدي 5 ملغ العيان عنده حاجه و80 سنه وحتى ايفن جود رينال فانكشن وانا هبقى مطمن وبصراحه اي اي اجري توتالي ذات يو هاف تو بي كوشس اند انديفيدواليز اند جايد لاينز ار جاست انديفيدواليزيشن بس ايفن اف اف وي بروتكت اول اور بيشنتس ذير از نو زيرو بليدنج ذير از بليدنج ايفن اف وي جيف اسبرين Uh, even if we don't give anything, probably intracranial hemorrhage can also occur. But the problem is in the real world data is there's a lot of underdosing, especially with apixaban. I don't know why. Um, and 2.5 is very weak as compared to the five milligrams. Uh, even if you look at the renal dialysis patients that were included in apixaban's renal atrial fibrillation study, and these are dialysis patients. They're not uh, some sort of CKD, they're dialysis patients. They were taking the five milligrams, most of them, if they do not have uh, two out of three, they're taking the five milligrams twice per day. And they have an FDA, Apixaban has an FDA indication now in dialysis patients. Yes. So um, I know what you're saying is absolutely 100% correct. We should individualize each patient. We should take care in all patients and stuff like that. But uh, we should also uh, look to the evidence. هو في الاخر اللي قاله الدكتور اسامه دلوقتي هو المشكله بتاعت الانرشيا في ان احنا بنستخدمش الفول دوز في الاولد ايج والسبب ان احنا بنستخدم اندر دوز وذاوت انديكيشن جاست فير تمام ولكن هو الفكره ان هو العيان ده برضه زي ما هو هاي لايبيلتي فور ثرومبوزس هو هاي لايبيلتي فور هيموريج وبالتالي وي شود ريفايز كل الانتراكتنج فاكتورز من الدراجز زي الانتي فليتلس ونون ستيرويد الانتي انفلاماتري كونكومتنت ديز والاذر دراجز وي شود كلوز مونيتور مونيتورنج للالدر ولكن وي شودن يوز اندر دوز بيكوز ذا كيس اور سم سم اذر سم فيو كيسز هاف ا كومبليكيشن فروم ذا بروبر دوز ذا بروبر دوز از فول دوز 5 ملغ توايس ديلي فور افكت بان اور 20 ملغ Impatient, otherwise, and can be uh, renal impairment. Be indication, and then I go with under two. Then the problem is the eyes, the stroke like this. For example, the doctors always are afraid that he will give full dose or proper dose. The fact that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the bleeding. The doctor is saying that he is afraid of the ولكن احنا بروبرلي المفروض ناخد الفول دوز ندور على الاذر كوز اللي ممكن تزود البليدنج وكلوز مونيتورنج مش نعمل اندر دوز. This is a very important a lot of patients especially the elderly are taking for example non steroidal for some orthopedics orthopedic complaints complaints for no reason yes and also the blood pressure maybe this patient had unnoticed uncontrolled high blood pressure. Renal impairment, we are not taking it. Renal impairment, we are not taking it. Yes. So we should revise all the data and close monitoring, but take the proper dose. The monitors are there in the trials and guidelines, not the under dose. Because this is the debate that is present, and we should be able to guide that we insist on the patients and doctors to take the proper doses as mentioned in the guidelines and in the trials. I, I think the, uh, the message from this important session is that an elderly patient is a special situation. And uh, all of us should uh, be very cautious while we are treating an elderly patient.
uh, we have to uh, properly assess the clinical situations, the different drug regimes he is already on. Uh, uh, the the uh, renal function uh, should not satisfy it by just creatinine. You should do uh, EGFR, you should do creatine clearance, uh, because this may guide you in therapy. We should, we should ass assess the bleeding risk and the thrombotic risk very accurately. Uh, and it's better, it's better to give the full dose if there is no uh, contraindication. Finally, Dr. Tamil, in here, Gaza. احنا بنشكر الدكتور وليد وكانت محاضره قيمه وسيتويشن صعب للالدرلي مع رينا الامبيرمنت وبنشكر الدكتور اسامه على مشاركه الدات الجلسه وبننتقل للاستاذ الدكتور احمد شوقي باذن الله والمودريتورز الجلسه القادمه يتفضلوا عشان يقدموا الدكتور. ثانك يو بروفيسور تامل ثانك يو بروفيسور اسامه اند اي ثينك وي هاف فيري امبورتنت سامري اوف ان امبورتنت ترايل will be given to us by uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi. And after that, I, uh, I hope you, all of you, join us in the uh, expert panel discussing the main points uh, we, we uh, initiated in this uh, uh, important uh, CME activity. Uh, Professor Shawi. Uh, thank you, Professor Ashraf. Thank you, the whole panel and uh, dear colleagues and uh, chair people. It's a pleasure being here. Um, and. Um, Today we're going to discuss the Augustus trial. Why are we going to discuss it? We'll see. First of all, these are my disclosure pertaining to this presentation. And what we're discussing is that a lot of people, a lot of elderly people are living longer. A lot of people are living longer so they can get an increase in atrial fibrillation as seen by Professor Walid's uh, presentation. And also because as we grow older, the possibility of coronary atherosclerosis, acute coronary or chronic coronary increases. That is to say that a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation are going to go procedures and there is an estimated 1.2 million anticoagulated, anticoagulated patients in just Europe who are candidates for PCI. So what is the correct regimen? And this was always a question to answer. To balance, as we were just discussing, the benefit of antithrombotic uh, medications and to avoid bleeding, which is a very important question. It started off years and years ago because there is an increase in bleeding and when we have a lot of uh, anticoagulants in addition to the P2Y12 and aspirin. And actually, if we look at the mortality for major bleeding in hospital, it's much higher than expected. So this is an important, really important thing that major bleeding it increases in hospital mortality significantly. And this is data from the CAF PCR registry. So what to do? Do we give the anticoagulation therapy alone? Do we give the antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet uh, alone? Do we give both? And I know till 20, before 2016, in atrial fibrillation guidelines, there were atrial fibrillation patients just taking aspirin, which is now, since 2016, is a contraindication. There is no benefit from aspirin in these patients. So do we give dual therapy or triple therapy? This is what we're going to discuss. The first study actually on dual versus triple therapy was the West study, and this included vitamin K antagonists in the double therapy, that is to say vitamin K antagonists in addition to clopidogrel versus vitamin K antagonist aspirin and clopidogrel. And as you can see, the bleeding is markedly reduced when you remove the aspirin. There is a 67% relative risk reduction of bleeding. So this is very important that bleeding, as we said, increases mortality, and in the same time, we need both an antiplatelet and an anticoagulant. And this actually did not just reduce bleeding, it also reduced all-cause mortality. And as we said, again, bleeding, as does stroke, increases mortality. So this is very important to take into consideration. And since the West, I think it was in 2013, 2014, I can't remember exactly, but there was a trend to omit aspirin in certain cases. But with the advent of the NOAX, I think better and better safety data has been seen. Let's take them chronologically. The Pioneer PCI was the first one, actually, for a NOAC in PCI. And actually, it had three arms. It had vitamin K plus aspirin plus clopidogrel, or DAPT, that is to say. 
rivaroxaban 50 milligrams, not 20, plus a single antiplatelet, usually it was clopidogrel. And in the middle, an arm which is a little bit obscure, and it uh, shouldn't be used uh, for AF prophylaxis against stroke, which is rivaroxaban's 2.5 BID. And this was like the ATLAS study in acute coronary syndromes in which rivaroxaban was given uh, in addition to dual antiplatelet in high ischemic burden patients. So what happened? Was rivaroxaban plus a single antiplatelet as good as or less in bleeding than a vitamin K antagonist and DAPT? Actually, yes. The clinically significant bleeding was much less without an increase in stent thrombosis or cardiovascular events. So taking a NOAC plus a single antiplatelet agent showed a significant improvement in clinically significant bleeding in Pioneer. Then came the bigger trans redual PCI, and they tried a triple arms too, warfarin and P2Y12 and aspirin, the bigger trans 110 and the P and clopidogrel, and actually some of the patients here took ticagrelor, very few, but there were. The bigger trans 150 milligrams plus uh, clopidogrel, and they were looking at which arm would be the best in. First, endpoint is major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, and of course the efficacy, which is the reduction or the non-increase in cardiovascular events. And as you can see, definitely with both uh, the Bigatran's dual therapy, that is to say the Bigatran and a P2Y12, whether 110 or 150, it was better than triple therapy with warfarin for bleeding, especially uh, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis Major Bleeding. There you can see definitely there's a significant reduction seen more even in the Debigatrans 110. Without, and this is important, without an increase of thromboembolic events or myocardial infarctions or unplanned revascularization or stent thrombosis. That is to say, not only are they better for bleeding, but they are as safe as giving the full spectrum of anticoagulation, and this is important to say. How about Augustus? Augustus was the third, but Augustus had another plan to go ahead. It was studying two hypotheses. It's not just one. It was studying the hypotheses of apixaban versus triple therapy, understandable, seen before in Reduel and Pioneer, but the other hypothesis is the aspirin. We know apixaban in Averroes really reduced the use of aspirin in uh, atrial fibrillation prophylaxis. Let's see how much this affects aspirin in PCI. These were actually patients, whether acute or chronic coronary syndrome, undergoing intervention, and they were atrial fibrillation patients, all of them, a, be prior, persistent, um, and they were randomized into four groups. Two big groups that start off with, apixaban, five milligrams, and vitamin K antagonists looking at an INR 2.2 to 3. Again, as we say, with apixaban, as you can see in the less bold color, 2.5 in selected patients. And selected patients means the two out of three rule, which is an age 80 or above, body weight 60 or below, or a creatinine 1.5 or above, not just the creatinine clearance, not any other uh, way of thinking. It's the five milligrams, which is used nearly in most patients or 95% of more patients. In each group, apixaban and vitamin K, there were two arms, which were also double-blinded and they were given either aspirin or placebo. That is to say, dual therapy or triple therapy. So the primary outcome, again, as seen in Reduel and Pioneer, was bleeding. And the secondary outcomes were the ischemic events and cardiovascular death or hospitalization. An important thing to see from this uh, uh, slide, it is an international study looking at a lot of different genetic uh, differences. It was not a simple uh, racial thing or ethnicity, it was really a multi-ethnic and multi-centric uh, approach. And this is really important, so everything we can apply to most patients. I'm sorry? Okay. And these are the primary outcomes, which is bleeding, 
uh, and whether it's the major bleeding or the clinical relevant non-major bleeding and the efficacy outcomes, which are death hospitalization or presence of ischemic events most dangerously is myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis and stroke. And the statistical analysis was done in a hierarchical testing, whether it's apixaban versus vitamin K, this was the hypothesis number one, or aspirin versus placebo hypothesis number two, first of all, in bleeding reduction, then in death and hospitalization, and then in death and ischemic events. This is called the hierarchical testing to see the statistical analysis. So we have four groups, as you can see, and each group consists of... Uh, of patients randomized either to apixaban by itself or vitamin K, those randomized to aspirin or placebo. So in total, there was around 4,600 plus patients. Their average age, and look at this, this is not a young population. Their average age was just below 71, 30% um, female, and this was a good amount of females recruited in such a patient, in uh, such a trial, sorry. And the Chad's VASC score, because a lot of us go on, Apixaban's Aristotle was a 2.1, Chad's VASC score, no, here was a 3.9, even higher than the randomized control studies of uh, atrial fibrillation prophylaxis. And these patients had a has blood score of 2.9, I remind you, on average, and a has blood score of three or more is considered a high risk for bleeding, okay? And they were, uh, uh, they had acute coronary syndromes or elective PCIs or even acute coronary syndromes that were managed medically. And this was highlighted upon in the guidelines like Professor Hany Raghi was saying in the first lecture. So this is important. A high Chad's VASC score, a high has blood score, and a lot of patients were taking the five milligrams BIG of apixaban. So what did happen to the first endpoint, which is bleeding, whether major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. The most bleeding happened with vitamin K and aspirin. Uh, the least was apixaban, as you can see. How about in aspirin? Taking a placebo did not increase the bleeding as expected, but aspirin increased it significantly, as you can see, with a number needed to harm a very low number of 14 patients. And this could be a cornerstone of the use of aspirin in triple therapy. How about the bleeding in total? The most bleeding happened in the vitamin K plus aspirin, followed there's apixaban and aspirin, vitamin K and placebo, and finally, vitamin, uh, sorry, a placebo and apixaban was the least you can see. There's a reduction, uh, a relative risk reduction of nearly uh, 50% when compared to the vitamin K and aspirin, or even more actually. And the is an 11.4% absolute risk reduction, which is incredible with a number needed to treat of only nine to avoid a big bleeding. How about the efficacy endpoints? Maybe apixaban without aspirin is safe, but is it good for the patient or does it increase death and hospitalization? Let's look at the data here with vitamin K, the events were 27.4. With apixaban, it was significantly lower. How about aspirin and placebo? We know aspirin is a very good antiplatelet. Does this omission increase death and hospitalization? Actually, placebo had a 24.7 and aspirin was had a 26.2 non-significant increase or decrease in death or hospitalization. It was actually similar. So looking at death and hospitalization in the four groups, this is vitamin K plus aspirin, vitamin K plus placebo, they are very equal to each other. A pixaban and aspirin just below that, and a significant reduction. Again, a 5.5% absolute risk reduction with a pixaban without aspirin with the number needed to treat 18. Numbers we do not see a lot these days. That is to say, this is an important landmark trial for uh, patients undergoing PCR. As you can see here, the uh, stroke rates definitely were much lower in the apixaban versus the vitamin K antagonism. But again, if you look at the ischemic outcomes, apixaban without aspirin is safe and even better when we're talking about strokes and reduction of hospitalization, 17% relative risk reduction in hospitalization. In uh, aspirin plus placebo, there was no significant difference. That is to say, Aspirin's role has been questioned in primary prevention and now is being questioned in triple therapy. And we'll see how the guidelines respond to that.
So in conclusion, the Augustus trial with atrial fibrillation and acute coronary syndrome or PCI or even patients not undergoing PCI, using apixaban without aspirin not only resulted in less bleedings and fewer hospitalizations without significant differences in ischemic events than the triple therapy. This is important to take into consideration. And this is why the guidelines in acute coronary syndromes, in acute coronary syndromes, the default strategy is to give triple therapy, including aspirin for a week. We know aspirin is important. And only in the high ischemic risk, we can uh, maintain it for a month. I mean in patients with atrial fibrillation, not to say all patients, okay? And then you give the double therapy up to six to 12 months, preferably 12 months if the patient ha doesn't have a high bleeding risk. And after 12 months, it's the NOAC alone. And this is important to take into consideration. In the chronic coronary syndrome, you do have the option of not even writing aspirin from the start and giving NOAC and P2Y12 for six months or even longer if the patient has a high ischemic burden. So here again, aspirin has been put to question in the context of an uh, apixaban-related study. And if you look at the guidelines, this is more very important because as you saw the previous present, uh, the previous, sorry, uh, trials, the Pioneer and the Reduit, in patients who have atrial fibrillation, acute coronary syndrome, and PCI, or even chronic coronary syndrome, look at the guidelines. If the patient has a high bleeding risk, has bled three or more, it's preferably to give rivaroxaban 15 milligrams as part of the dual therapy. Same here with the Bigatran. If the patient has a high bleeding risk, has bled three or more, preferably giving the bigger trans 110 and uh, clopidogrel, not the 150. But they did not even discuss apixaban. This, in an indirect method, shows the efficacy, but more importantly, the safety of apixaban as shown by the Augustus trial. So my take-home messages are definitely, if the patient's going to have triple or dual therapy, whether acute coronary syndrome or chronic chronic syndromes, DOAX or NOAX are preferred. Augustus not only proved the efficacy of apixaban and its safety, but also proved the limitations of using aspirin in certain subset of patients, especially for a chronic coronary syndromes, the use is dwindling and dwindling. And in acute coronary syndromes, we use it for a period of one uh, week up to one month in those with high ischemic burden. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, can I have two questions? Can I ask you? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, please. Um, there's no offense, but uh, my questions are, first, abixipan and the vitamin antagonists were given in this trial to patients in an open-label manner. And this may have introduced some intervention bias. This is my, my first question. Uh -huh. My second question, those patients were randomizedly assigned uh, by means of an interactive voice response system to, do, to, to, to take either uh, uh, abixapan or vitamin K antagonist and also to receive the aspirin or matching the placebo. Uh, and, and can this conceal this is a randomization? And in, additionally, uh, as we see here in the, uh, in the trial, the, the randomization was um, certified according to the indication. ACS or PCI at en enrollment. Okay, first of all, this uh, this study was a double branded study. Uh, there was no bias when we're talking about uh, allocation, um, and this is the standard um, of care in all randomized controlled data and studies. Of course, there are limitations to all studies, and again, the number of patients were uh, what we call diluted when we randomized the patients into four subgroups, not only two. But the consistency of data, the high risk of bleeding, the high risk of thrombosis, the high risk of coronary events, really shows this robustly that using uh, NOAX, here apixaban, omitting aspirin in most patients, again, we use them in acute coronary syndrome as part of triple therapy. I did not say anything other than that, but don't use aspirin indefinitely. Don't use aspirin 
post one month, this is uh, what uh, the trial tried to conclude. Actually, uh, Ahmed, uh, it seems that uh, one year ago, uh, there was a presentation called uh, the time to say goodbye aspirin. I think, uh, I think there is now uh, many clinical scenarios in which we could uh, withdraw aspirin from the region of our uh, patients. Uh, one of them is in the presence of atrial fibrillation and uh, acute cause syndrome and when we need triple drug. This could, uh, uh, in the future, apply to even patients without atrial fibrillation. Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, aspirin has an important role in secondary prevention. It's definitely there uh, in patients without atrial fibrillation. Of course, with atrial fibrillation, adding of aspirin protects the coronaries a little bit more, but increases the bleeding so much more. Um, this is a point. The other point is uh, aspirin still has a role in primary prevention in the high-risk category. Don't forget that ascend and arrive are important studies to reduce the uh, uh, use of aspirin. But most of the patients, in fact, nearly all of them were moderate risk patients, not high risk patients. And high risk patients may benefit, even in diabetics, from aspirin. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed, for this actually very elegant data of a very important presentation. And I think also uh, uh, the use of uh, NOAC in the uh, coronary artery disease patients post PCI or without with equal fibrillation, I think it is now. Uh, a strategy which should take place uh, in our management. But my question here is about, uh, with all this evidence we have now from the trial and the guidelines, uh, I think it comes uh, now uh, uh, that we have to have a score, a global score, not a ischemic score, uh, uh, separately and bleeding score separately. We have, a, we have to have a global score. We have to have also the gastroenterologist, the uh, uh, neurologist, uh, with us in the management of those patients, uh, uh, I think if we uh, uh, in the future have such a score, I think this is will improve uh, uh, our management in such pain. Because I know in a lot of uh, circumstances, we have a lot of inertia in prescribing treble therapy for the fear of bleeding. Uh, 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 despite that the patient may, might have uh, may have uh, a lot of ischemic uh, 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 risk events. So I think uh, a presence of uh, a group score will be more beneficial. The uh, use of the joint management and co-managed uh, 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 strategies with the gastro gastroenterologist and neurologist, I think, is also uh, uh, important. And it is deserving here to say, from the practical point of view, that a big seven per se is uh, is much more safer as regard bleeding for those patients with high risk of GI bleeding. And this is a practical point we have to mention here in such uh, a, a very elegant session. Thank you, uh, Ahmed, again for this elegant presentation. Thank you. Uh, love your comments. Exactly. I agree totally. Um, and the scores are there. You know, you can use the Hasbled, you can use the Crusade, but definitely if you have a, a patient with AFib, use the Hasbled, regardless he's in acute uh, or in a chronic coronary syndrome. But I agree totally. We have to look to the whole picture. Okay, now, uh, uh, now let me uh, uh, take the opportunity of having uh, uh, such uh, great uh, faculty panel uh, to start uh, a panel discussion and, and uh, expert opinion about some points raised in these uh, sessions uh, so that we can conclude the most of the uh, 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 sessions and issues raised. And let me share uh, 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 sc my screen here and uh, start to discuss with you uh, in, in a few minutes some points I want to raise here. Um, I think this is a point we want to uh, take your opinion. First of all, what about the generics? Uh, Dr. Hani Raghi already uh, uh, gave an important uh, uh, opinion about using generics. Uh, can I have your insights about this issue, Ahmed Shawi? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, generics are very important. We know the American market has 70% uh, of its sales is from generics and the European has 50%. But 
what most of the countries uh, like ours uh, are not generics actually they're copies and copies are just uh, medications with uh, the same ingredient i don't know how mixed and this is in a very uh, different different entity um, how rigorously does the ministry of health look for uh, bioavailability and stuff like that that's another question uh, I'm not really questioning our uh, companies that are, have other medications, but actually in a, such a patient in which we are looking to prevent a stroke, uh, I would be a little bit, a little bit, uh, not a little bit, a very much actually afraid when talking about a, a medication that I'm giving, not to do a regular checkup with an INR or anti-factor 10. Okay, um, I think uh, that's why uh, the FDA uh, uh, have a special uh, uh, system to approve generics. Uh, so, uh, uh, although generics are very important because they are cost-effective, they are less costly, however, uh, uh, the efficacy and the, to be sure that the ingredient is uh, okay because we are management uh, we are dealing with uh, patients that may have stroke and we know all of us know what, what the meaning of a stroke so i think uh, one won't be sure that uh, the the medicine he is giving is uh, a perfect one uh, because there is no uh, second uh, there is no cho uh, this, uh, choice uh, are risky enough to have stroke very difficult uh, to give uh, drugs and see what happened uh, in this uh, occasion. So I hope we will uh, we will uh, have in Egypt uh, uh, such system like FDA have to uh, uh, advise us about the genetic. Uh, now I want to ask Professor Tamer, uh, w when we give you give one of the work, you 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 think first of the efficacy or the safety. How you balance these issues? level but uh, uh, the fear is, uh, is one issue uh, if we have a has split score uh, high of um, chat bus score high we are afraid of uh, pleading more and more and we can go for um, for less dose for um, less use of the uh, drug of luck here uh, the recommendation here nothing there, 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 is, I think there is something in the voice. Is Dr. Atif with us? Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't hear Tamer. Actually, uh, uh, Tamer, I don't, uh, uh, we don't hear you. You, you hear Tamer, uh, Ahmed Chawi, Walid? I can't, I can't hear anything. Uh, actually. No. This is completely wrong from uh, Dr. Ahmed Chawi. Walid, do you hear me? The voice in the system, or uh... yes, yes, I hear, I hear now, Trat. I think if we hear uh, everybody here, everyone, I think the problem is in Tamer's mic. So uh, we, we hear it, we hear it, uh, uh, each other, yes? Yes, okay, I well, hear you. So I, uh, actually the question now, uh, Dr. Sayed, Dr. Atif, is about the uh, uh, the efficacy and safety. I mean, we, we know that Apexaban is a very safe drug compared to other NWAP especially regarding GIT bleeding, uh, regarding the uh, intracranial hemorrhage. But we, all of us want to be sure that it is also effective. Dr. Said. Uh, as you mentioned, and as uh, Professor uh, Ahmed mentioned in his elegant presentation, that I think uh, uh, there is a comparable efficacy between uh, uh, rivaroxaban and abixaban in most of the trials 
but I think uh, if we are looking to, as I mentioned precisely in my previous comment, that we have to look globally to the to the picture globally. We have to have the efficacy and the safety in the same plate. So I think thinking like this, I think the Abix Seven will have much more uh, 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 weight than the River Seven in such a point if we take it globally for efficacy and safety. Because as you know, in most of instances and in most of our patients, practically speaking, uh, we have a problem in the GI, like gastropathy, erosive gastropathy, a lot of medications which make the uh, gastrium amenable for gastropathy. So I think uh, if we are taking the safety, which is given by the Apex to the uh, uh, to our uh, strategy of management, I think Apex will take the hand uh, uh, over River Exapan. I agree with you, Sayed, uh, and actually this study, which is uh, I, I'm sharing with you now, is a retrospective study of uh, and the meta-analysis of, uh, uh, I think uh, it was the th three, uh, three, nine thousand patients. Uh, uh, I know there is no direct comparison clinical trial, but this is retrospective analysis, and it showed that uh, uh, it is not only safe regarding the level of uh, the percentage of intracranial hemorrhage uh, compared with those uh, prescribed patient prescribed liparoxifan. As you know, the, the, this number is 12 uh, or 13 per thousand person years uh, for apixapan intracranial hemorrhage compared to 21 per thousand person years with rivaroxifan. Uh, and this is a, a, a very important, uh, and even it is not only safe, but even the incidence rate of ischemic stroke or systemic embolization was 6.6 .6 per 1,000 person years for those prescribed apixapan compared with 8 per 1,000. So it is at least as effective or even more effective than rivaroxapan in this retrospective analysis. And the safety, there is no doubt about uh, the importance of safety. I'd, li I'd like here, but, but to add, Dr. Ashraf, the very uh, important data you mentioned, but mm -hmm. precisely in Egyptians, I think we have the issue of the GI, the GI problems, the the the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the erosive gastritis, uh, 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 the non uh, strategic uh, 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 medications of non steroidal anti inflammatories without any reason. I think these put the uh, the gastrium of all the Egyptians at risk of GI bleeding, and we have to consider to consider this practically when are prescribing and walk. Uh, so I think yeah. this will take uh, uh, the big seven will take the privilege of this. Yes, uh, sure, and I think uh, the, the the coming point is now uh, subgroup of diabetic and renal, and I think Dr. Walid Abdu uh, uh, prescribed the uh, uh, analyze the renal uh, patients with. Uh, um, but I want here to uh, uh, highlight the importance of the diabetic subgroup in the Aristotle trials uh, uh, that concluded that patients with diabetes receiving apixapan has lower rate of systemic embolization uh, 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 with all, and all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, even intracranial hemorrhage was less than uh, 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 placebo in the using in the Aristotle. So it seems that uh, even in the diabetic subgroup, which are a very important high risk group, it is uh, effective and it is uh, safe in this uh, group. This is uh, FDA uh, recommendation for the renal dose adjustment. Uh, and as you know, the uh, apixapan is uh, the most favorable one regarding uh, from NOAC regarding the uh, renal dose. Uh, adjustment. If you have, uh, they depend on the creatinine clearance. If you have normal creatinine clearance above 80, if you have moderate degree of uh, renal dysfunction, uh, creatinine clearance up to 50, even up to 30 milliliter per minute, you should give 5 milligram BID. You can also, you can only use 2.5 milligram BID if any two of the following. Kariat, kariat more than 1.5, age more than 180, and body weight less than 160. However, if your patients approaching 15 milliliter per minute creatine clearance, here you should use with cautions. Why? Because clinical trial excluded patients with serum kariat more than 2.5 and creatine clearance less than 25. 
Of course, if the creatinine clearance is less than 15 milli per minute, it is not recommended. However, in the hemodialysis patients, you can give uh, according to uh, risk uh, assessment. Uh, I want to raise a question now uh, for the panel about the issue of twice daily dose. Is, is, is that of concern when you are giving? Is, is there is any privilege of having the two uh, tablets per day compared to once daily, or it is important to prescribe for the compliance issue a once daily tablet? So, Shaui, can you comment on that? Uh, definitely, when you have one tablet per day, the compliance is a little bit better. But again, if you have one tablet per day and you get a complication, probably the complication will persist for a longer period of time. Uh, could the two dose uh, per day of apixaban is the secret ingredient to the, the success of the safety profile to Eliquis? And this is a, I think it has a role. There are data to suggest this. Um, but again, uh, speaking pragmatically, of course, one tablet per day is better than two uh, for compliance reasons. But I think Eliquis really got it right when they had the two tablets per day. It had the safety uh, regimen really up there. Okay, do you know that uh, the, there is an important study concluded that based, uh, again, it is a, a retrospective analysis of uh, real-world data on the use of twice daily. Uh, uh, of course, you, we have to know that uh, uh, all the oral uh, anticoagulants, NUAC, have similar half-life. However, some were used uh, in once daily dose, some twice daily dose. I, I agree with you that once daily dose is uh, okay with the compliance, but maybe, as you said exactly, Dr. Shawi, that twice daily dose of Eliquis may be the uh, uh, key of success regarding efficacy and safety. And the conclusion with that trial that based on the available phase three study evidence, the twice daily dosing regimen of non-vitamin K antagonist or anti appears to offer a more balanced risk-benefit profile with respect to stroke prevention and intracranial hemorrhage. So I'm, I'm sure this depends on the uh, lot of medications uh, the, our patients is, uh, is already on, but however, if he is uh, educated, compliant one, uh, it's better, for, uh, it seems that it's better to have uh, daily uh, dose. And uh, I will leave the mic to Dr. Atif if you have some conclusion uh, and to close I, this uh, I, session. I have a comment to Ashraf, uh, if you allow me, regarding the renal patients and diabetic patients. Uh, Abixaban uh, um, actually has uh, least uh, dependent on the renal elimination, about 20% just uh, renal elim uh, elimination versus about 30 something in the Rivaroxaban, 50% renal elimination in the Edoxaban, and about 80% in the uh, Dabigatra. So it is the most appropriate actually in renal patients. Uh, another thing in the diabetic patients, um, most of them already uh, suffering from gastropathy. And uh, many physicians uh, prescribe aspirin, for example, for diabetic patients, just for as a primary prevention, maybe without taking care that they are already on anticoagulation, which may increase the GI bleeding. Also, many diabetics also taking multivitamins, which cause also gastropathy and, uh, and, and the erosive gastritis, which also increase the risk of GI bleeding. So, uh, for diabetic patients, it is more safe to uh, uh, choose the, the NUEX with the least effect on the risk of GI bleeding. I think also, uh, Dr. Ashraf, I think uh, some of the attendees may like to hear uh, some practical point from uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi when uh, one of the dose, daily doses, NUEX like Abik Saban, you miss one of the doses. For example, if you have the second dose at 9 p.m. and you miss it, uh, 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 how many hours you can uh, take this uh, tablet or you leave it to the next uh, coming dose? Um, if you remember it very quickly, give it. If not, uh, if more than four or five hours, you go to the next dosage. That's the best uh, possible situation. Um, uh, this is the good thing about Apixaban. If you miss one dose, uh, the effect is still there uh, and uh, the bleeding, uh, sorry, uh, the anticoagulation is still uh, partially present. If you miss one dose of a single uh, per day, 
oral anticoagulant, uh, the, the thrombotic risk is markedly increased. Yeah. I think, what Dr. Reid, you would like to add? Up to six hours. You can, if yes, you up to six up, hours you can take it. Hours, if you more can, than six hours, for them, you, you can just skip the dose and pick the next one. Yes, okay. This is a practical point. So, Professor Atif? I'd like uh, to make uh, some conclusion rapidly. Uh, because uh, we are different, but we should uh, have uh, one coin to, uh, to buy by. Uh, first of all, the oral anticoagulants are not candy. They are not sweeters. Therefore, the copies, uh, the, the Dr. Ahmed Ma'al, uh, Dr. Ashraf, and we should have uh, uh, a system in, uh, for the observation and for the qualification of the, gen of, of the copies and generics that are in the market, especially in, uh, in these uh, drugs, because these drugs are bleeders. They are not candy. This is number one. Number two, we should tailor our uh, practice according to the uh, patients we see, the age from the age of R, to from uh, the, uh, the gender, uh, and we should, uh, we should verify all this in order to choose the suitable oral anticoagulant. Uh, for the, um, the, uh, the FDA, uh, for example, now they approve, I think, uh, of in uh, renal dialysis. If I'm wrong, if somebody must say uh, yes or no. Uh, for uh, the uh, the antidotes, we still not have the antidotes in uh, in our market, and therefore we should be cautious when we prescribe these uh, bleeders uh, for our patient. Uh, I uh, I miss anything. That's, that's uh, yes. uh, oral oral dose or twice per day, uh, we should look for the compliance. We should uh, look for the adherence of the of the patients, uh, and we should ask the patient if he will have one dose per, per day or he can continue or on uh, on two doses of the day. Uh, so he uh, he he can't uh, forget it, and he should adhere to the medication. This is uh, this need a discussion between us and uh, and the patients. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, now uh, thank uh, Pfizer, important uh, group of experts. We want to thank ICOM, and we want to thank you all, and see you in next waves, inshallah. Kusam taibin. Kusam taibin.